Hi, welcome to How I Became a Theosophist. Excuse me, I have a cough drop. And, but more importantly, my special guest today is Dorothy Bell. And Dorothy, why don't you tell us first, for the handful of people who may not know you, where you're from. I'm from <laughs> Down Under. <laughs> Down Under? Down Under, Australia. Melbourne, Australia. Or oh. Melbourne, Australia. M Melbourne. Yeah. And, and then you can make this answer as short or as detailed as you want. People actually like the detailed answers, no pressure. But how did you come to <laughs> theosophy? How did you first become interested in it? Do you remember, the, was it a book, a name? Um, the word theosophy was beyond me, but I think at the time when I was um, way back in the 70s, um, I, I read a book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull. <laughs> and I book. found out that others have read that too. And, I can remember this day, I, I just didn't put it down and um, I was doing my washing, I had a flat in the middle of Melbourne and doing my washing and I was reading the thing and at the end I just made a statement to the universe, I said, I want to know, I want to know. Really? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. And I was telling some friends about it because it was Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, I said, I had a very strange experience this afternoon and I described the book and then I described my action, reaction. And they said, what did you want to know? I said, I don't know, I just wanted to know. And that was kind of a signal to me that really I'd always wanted to know why I was on the planet. Yeah. From, from really? Prob yeah, young. teenager, yeah. Yeah. just, yeah. you know, I used to think, yeah. what on earth. I was brought up in a very um, remote rural area of the state of Victoria, which Melbourne's the capital. So there wasn't a lot going on in childhood, and that's uh, a fair while ago. But... I just wanted to know why I was there, why I'm here, why am I here? So then you go through all the things of going to primary school and going to high school on a bus and doing that sort of thing and going to uni and that soon gets put on the back burner. But um, things like the book Jonathan Livingston Seagull and some friends um, in the 70s and 80s who were responding to a growth of um, probably new age bookshops in Melbourne, they're everywhere, so we do lunch times and go and have a look at them and yeah. grab some books and uh, this got these books. I picked up a book one day and Krishnamurti, you know, I thought, oh, that's a strange name and next minute I was <laughs> reading it and, and I really was an avid reader of Krishnamurti in the mid 70s. But I, uh, this, I suppose, these are the sparks along the yeah, way. Yeah, right, but right. Did, I didn't do anything with any of it. It was just kept me jollying along, I think. Yeah. And, um, then I don't know what was next. He had a friend, he, he was a mad UFO researcher. He belonged to <laughs> this weird. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, it's good fun though. Oh yeah. And he said, Dorothy, let's go and find a channel, a medium. I said, what for, Ian? And he said, I want, he said, I read this book. You read it. I've got this book from America. It's called um, Prelude to Landing on Planet Earth. And it was all about this group in Ossini, New York, who had contacted, apparently, extraterrestrials through a channel, through a medium. Yeah. So Ian just wanted to do that too. He said, let's go and find a channel. And I thought, well, where do you, where do you find one? And so, what, yeah, where do you? <laughs> we got the ads and what have you, but word of mouth, and we went a few, went sort of few things. So you can see I was kind of touching on the fringes here and there along, you know, along, along the way in late 70s, early 80s, and, and in the um, uh, 90s probably, I was caught up in the New Age activities, I, um, spiritual healing, mm -hmm, uh, Reiki mm -hmm, healing, mm -hmm. uh, Sakem healing, which is the ancient Egyptian version of Reiki. In that, I was in a couple of friends found out that they were clairvoyant or one read palms, and I thought, well, that's very strange. So I went along to see what they did. I was curious, so I was curious about this fringe area. And then yeah. in the 90s, things started to happen to me that I needed to find out what was the meaning of them? There's sort of very spontaneous psych really? psychic experiences in different countries around the world. Oh. I, I, did, I traveled a lot. I traveled, uh, you know, I've been to Tibet and Nepal and and, uh, and So you Egypt. went to, for example, Tibet or Egypt and, yeah. and, and what was it, almost like a memory? Or, well, or the different things that pop energy, up. There's, yeah. yeah, there was energies at the, the Temple of Isis. Uh, there was things happening that I thought, this is weird, because I was very left brain. I'm very... 
brought up that way. Um, education, a- education, background, background, and background history, yep. and yep. yeah. So I think those experiences really were rattling my cage a bit to get me out of this sort of yeah. tunnel vision of yeah. everything had to be logical and empirically proven, and right. and these experiences right. didn't have an explanation. Right, and I kept saying, "Where's the handbook on these things? Right, where's, where's the rule book?" You right, know? right. So, um, one thing led to another. I found myself doing some, maybe some civil service work with with um, a group of guys who were at a positive living centre in St Kilda, and they um, they had AIDS, so there was a little bit of support for for uh, at a retreat for these people who had AIDS. So I went and did some Reiki and things like that, and. Things started to happen when I was doing Reiki too. I started to get some thoughts that I thought, these are not for me, these are for ah. whoever was lying on the table. So I thought, well, that's pretty strange. How does all that work too? So um, I thought, this happens to real clairvoyance, right? This happens to real people, not those who are just... <laughs> 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 it was a rich time in the 90s, I tell you. And then uh, through that work, we got an invitation... That all the workers got an invitation to go to the Brahma Kumaris Convention Centre or the Meditation Centre in Melbourne. And uh, the Brahma Kumaris are an international organisation uh, based in India, up in Rajasthan. And they have lots of free meditation centres all throughout the world. And they um, are very Hindu and their origins are very unique in the fact that they're run by a sort of women, but they were set up by a man. Uh, who hmm. who decided that that was the way to go. I think he set it up in 1936. But they had an ashram up in Rajasthan. Well, one thing led to another. I found myself going to meditation. and I, The draw to go to India was very strong. So I went to India with them a couple of years running in 1998 and 99 because I responded to, the, I think, the teachings there. They resonated with me. And, and the major teachings were related to the evolution of the soul, the soul journey, to becoming soul conscious instead of body conscious, you know, to that switch, um, to become your own, there are four things I learned from them, I'll probably forget them all, but to become your own master or mighty authority, that's a, a cliche a saying that you had to find your own truth. That's nice. And there's one more that I can't remember, oh yeah, the law of karma, that it's everything makes everything accurate, not right or wrong, good or bad, everything is accurate. So that was four strange ideas that I um, came across with them. And being brought up a Roman Catholic, they were different. You know? Yeah. So, so there's little things happening along the way. Quite a bit. Yeah. So <laughs> came back to Melbourne after a couple of the last trips to India, and friends said, "Oh, let's go up. To, there's a lecture on the uh, Theosophical Society." And I said, "I couldn't say it. Really. Theosophical is quite difficult for newcomers to say." <laughs> I can remember my father. <laughs> I can never say it. And uh, I said, okay. So I went along and it's just very, no melodrama. I thought, yeah, okay, I'll sign up. Yeah. So that, that's a long way of saying right. I kind of fell into it, really. But I thought the explana- the theory, I wanted to find out what was behind all that ha- Exa- had been happening. You know? Yeah, because you've been having a lot of experiences. Yeah. And, and, but that's kind of one maybe characteristic, right, of theosophy is that it's more than just having the experience, it's trying to understand how oh, it works. Yeah. Yeah. How it works. yeah, that was, it was like having those experiences was um, putting me totally out of my comfort zone. Yeah, Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And you don't tell anyone about it. You, one or two close friends Right, who, right, right. So and you, even then you care. Even, <laughs> then, you know, even then, you're like, you know, it's really <laughs> keeping you know, mainstream. I used to have a job, I was doing things, so you don't. And that's quite wrong because we are multi you know, we're multi dimensional. And, and right. No, I think all things should be explored. I mean, that's what we're here to do, are we not? I agree. And, you know, I, I, I've noticed um, that sort of you seem to be really comfortable with questions that don't have easy answers. So now, is that something that evolved over the years? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because I've seen many, I've seen you, let's say, for example, leading a discussion or being part of a discussion, and it really doesn't matter where the topic goes, you always seem comfortable with kind of putting it uh, within a framework of, of your theosophical s- studies. Yeah, I think it has changed me. I have changed within the framework yeah. of understanding 
no, look, the ancient wisdom is just, you know, it's a living energy. That's what, it's a living energy and it's just the oneness of all things is, is just, uh, you can sense sometimes the reality of it. And I think some of the things I've been doing with people and going up to New Zealand with some people there and my focus has been on developing unveiled spiritual perception. That's, that's a key, leaving the intellect and journeying further towards the intuition. But starting, I guess, I guess I'm yeah. following on what Annie Besant was talking about. You know her vision of a new civilization, a new culture? And I know she started off down at Ojai um, with Cretona, but she had a vision of a future, a future civilization. That, and I thought, well, you know, you can't all bunch up in one spot, but maybe it's an inner culture, it's an inner, a growth of your inner self. Yeah. That when you get rid of all the stuff, that you naturally link up wherever you are around the world. And this having an unveiled spiritual perception to me is the kickoff point. Because when you think about culture, and, and change and cultural change the very first thing you look at is how do people look at things and assess things how do they see things because from that you get beliefs and attitudes and you get actions so to me um, that's the first a very big step if you want to really try to get close to that the message that Blavatsky was giving in the secret doctrine that Annie Besant were giving, learning to see, and even the Bhagavad Gita, learning to see, learning to see, you know, I think Annie Besant talked about the, the God self within or the, the true self within every person, and not as just an intellectual concept, but as I sit with you, you know, yeah. I see you as, as someone who, who has, has a soul history as I have, someone who has chosen this incarnation in this way to do these things for certain purposes of the soul's growth. So when you start seeing everyone like that, it takes a long time to start doing that. It, yeah. it gives you another slant and it, it helps to break down that separateness. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit to this question because we, you brought up the intellect and you you are very comfortable with the intellect and you you seem to treat it with great respect but then you're also always careful to give it this asterisk of it shouldn't be it shouldn't rule something else the intuition of the booty so uh this question as i have it written is how do you balance the intellectual riches in theosophical literature with the danger of being trapped in the intellect conceptual thought or is that already built into the literature maybe I think it's built into the yeah. literature on only on on um, like the gate the path the voice of the silence uh, when you're really looking to to uh, I suppose open up expand your consciousness into beyond the intellectual you know intellectual realms if you like when you want to expand your consciousness using using I'll say the intellectual propositions and knowledge that we have gained through the study of the literature. So to me, intellectual knowledge is very, very important, but it doesn't stop there. And uh, I must acknowledge Professor Timey. I, I, I'm much appreciative of his, what he was doing, I think, groundbreaking breaking work in suggesting that the bridge, he didn't say the bridge, but I'm saying a bridge needs to be built between the intellectual and the spiritual. But he talked about perception. He talked about we must, um, we must, I think Annie Besson said this too, we must have a grounding in intellectual knowledge of the propositions or eternal verities. But Timely went on to say that, but we don't, it doesn't mean that accumulating intellectual knowledge is just going to get us to that spiritual expansion of consciousness where we, we maybe bridge, get to the bridge of going into more clarity and seeing things as they truly are. Um, I think... I sort of have talked about the theosophical worldview as being a set of key propositions that we can use. And in my talk the other other week at um, the convention, I, I I kind of tried to illustrate how you bring these teachings in when you 
look at situations, when you look at a tree, when you look at nature, when you actually look at your own and monitor your own um, interactions with, with people. And I'm in the middle now of thinking, maybe, you know, once upon a time, as a, I wanted to be, you know, when you're a kid, you've got to be a good girl, and boys can be boys, but you've got to be a good girl, all right? And it's like you've <laughs> got to keep improving. <laughs> I had to get that. That's true. You had to keep improving yourself. But if the personality, as HBB said, is an artificial construct that relies on memory, right? You're trying to improve an artificial construct in a way. You, you, if you say, "I've got to improve," point. You, you're really identifying with the personality. Yeah. So, going back to the idea of culture, I think what um, Madame Blavatsky and Annie Besant's vision were trying to say. I think Vasky was saying, wake up. She's saying, look, here's a picture of the universe. Open the door. Go and go and test it out. I think Annie Besant was trying to write things more simply than the complexity of the writings that Blavatsky was doing. But they still wanted us to be liberated. They wanted us to be free, to know who we truly were, to be who we truly are. And the old way of being a better person you know, ticking off the checklist yeah, right, of virtue, right, it right. just didn't gel with that. Doesn't so go, I'm yeah. thinking, if you start with it, with just seeing things from, I'll say it's the other shore, but it's not the other shore, because all is one, it's one unified reality, one unified existence, and multiple dimensions and levels of things everywhere, it's, it's all one. So, you know, if it's that, if we start seeing things like that, the, that inner, Inner transformation will lead to outer transformation. You see, in time, I'm saying it in doesn't happen overnight. It might happen in a few lifetimes, even or in many, many, many. Yes, um, yeah. Just see the principle. <laughs> but, but there's hope. Yeah. Um, could I ask you um, why do you think it's set up? That is the universe or the spiritual universe. <laughs> I'm sorry, but sounds like a good well, question. with those nice answers, you you asked for it. So. Um, <laughs> Okay. But 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 why do you think it's set up that we come into this incarnation, and 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 it's, we're so all the momentum for most of us is to be distracted away from a spiritual search, to be distracted away from knowing who we really are, um, to forget our previous incarnations if you believe in that, to for, to get caught up in materialism. It's so attractive, right? So many things about materialism and about the personality. Why do you think that's the, s the playing ground? <laughs> that's a very, very... Mm, can I just make a few comments? It's okay. probably a way to okay. express what I okay. really believe. But, okay. sure, but, sure. but it's part of it. It is part of it. I wouldn't deceive you. But from the moment we're born, when you think of it, from the moment, even within the womb, we're still getting effects from the outside environment, right? That's what I believe. And from the moment we are born, we're born into separateness. Yeah. We're, and for, and we're born into be, and that is consolidated and crystallized, and, yeah. and and from from that we're not we're not born into who and, and our parents and our teachers and all authority figures don't say, oh you're a soul on another journey. Okay, well what you wonder what your issues are or this this time around. It's the opposite of that because I was brought up on one lifetime. Yeah, right. One lifetime. Oh, At yeah. the end of it, reward and punishment. Yeah. How was I brought up as a child? Reward and punishment. So there's this this culture that was probably mm. from maybe the church for many, many hundreds, a couple of thousand years, maybe. I think that it's social conditioning, it's social enculturation. And and that's why we don't we we think our personality is who we are. It's who we are. There's, it's seamless. Right. There's oh, no yeah. other. I mean, oh, yeah. no. You right. know, and you know what? I reckon we're even fearful of, um, you know, beliefs are things that divide people. Beliefs, you know, we just yeah, we, right. we, we take them on. We we swallow them down. We we rah rah and we, we do this and that, <laughs> and uh, we even kill for them. Maybe you know some people. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's a serious side of it. But and I think we're fearful if we if we haven't got beliefs. What have we got? How do we operate? You know that—that's a scary thought that's for scary, some people. Yeah. But really, if we can, if we can, I'm talking seriously about the beliefs, probably the negative beliefs we have about ourselves, and all the valued judgmental things we we have developed in terms of a, what's right behaviour and wrong behaviour, 
this comes through from our childhood too. All, oh, all, yeah. And, and this is reward punishment. And, and our need to belong. You know, I, I love playing with Abraham and Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs because they had it laid out for you. you. You're programmed into physical needs. You've got to have them. Well, we do, don't we? You've got to keep the vehicle going. Right. Okay? And then the emotional needs. Need to belong. Try and be a nonconformist. It doesn't get you anywhere in this life. But to see it, need to belong. Need to be approved. Need to be accepted. Their, their emotional needs are, are I'll say this, are, are, are the, the personality and our emotions, I think, are programmed into us. From birth. Now, if that being so, we're caught. We're in that prison. Right. That's which, the, it's that's it's the... a prison of fear because fear comes from not measuring up, fear of not meeting other people's expectations. That's a big one. Yeah. So I just wonder, though, I mean, why don't we have a spiritual universe where there was a little bit less of that? <laughs> and, and, uh, and then we could just progress more, couldn't we? Or no? Yeah. Is that a naive answer? Maybe, oh, so we oh, need this I'm, resistance? I'm that. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. Like, that's why I come over to America. <laughs> <laughs> So I go to Cook Taylor and coming up to walk. <laughs> no, 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 don't take that too seriously. Yeah, yeah. No. But why? Because we're finding out who we are. That's, we, we're here to find out, are we not? This is how I see it. I should always preface my remarks. This is how I see it. We're here to find out who we truly are, to be who we truly are, to heal ourselves, to make ourselves whole. Yeah and to understand the oneness, to understand how the one operates on the earth, to understand the universal laws and work with them. And that's enough for a start, isn't it? So <laughs> if it wasn't so difficult, I mean, the world's in a very, it's very so, yeah, sorry state. It's, it's, yeah. You could say it's going down the gurgler. But if you didn't have, if one didn't have, if I didn't have the ancient wisdom as almost a part of me, as, as that is a... Not a belief, but a, it's there. It's it's to me. It, it's real. It's real for everyone, and everyone's touching out and touching and reaching it in their own ways, and that's uniquely important and uniquely so. We'll get to the same place eventually, but unique ways. But for me, it's the ancient wisdom just resonates so much, and I couldn't live. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I I wouldn't be living without it. You know, it is living. It's a living power. Yeah, you don't seem to have that separation so much between the intellectual um, taking in of the ancient wisdom and then your sort of spiritual, whatever, spiritual experiences. For you, they seem one and the same. Ah, or, or, that's a lot of, yeah. Yeah, that, that's sort of, has taken a lot of pain and suffering, <laughs> yeah. in, in a sense. Yeah. Because you just can't sit in the intellectual comfort of an armchair with intellect, you know, intellectually and say, Yes, well, I am being a theosophist. Yeah, right. I'm still trying. I'm I'm working on being a theosophist. But to <laughs> me, it's being one is is being the wisdom, because theosophy to me is divine wisdom, and if you are the living, a living expression of the divinity from of within who you are, you're being that. But but also, it's not enough just to, for example, sit, find some meditation that works for you, yeah. and just use that, because then you're not developing another part of yourself, right? If you're, if you're not tempering it with yeah. people who've gone before you. Absolutely, yeah. 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 It, yeah. It's, it's like a team effort. We're, you know, we're, yeah. we're one human wave, we're one consciousness energy, massive energy consciousness, if you like, like another way of looking at it. And we're all interconnected and we're communicating by words about 20% and the rest is other stuff communicating. You know, so we, we've got a lot to learn about how we are so interconnected and how everything is interconnected. Nothing stands alone. And uh, those times when, you know, in your life when you feel that there's no one there, there's nothing there, there's nothing to live for, everything's, the rug's been pulled out from under your feet and right. we, we go through these magnificent experiences, right. uh, it, you know, in order to, to learn what was, you know, a pattern because I think People say to me, well, I don't know about past lives, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be learning this life. Well, I can think we, we can look at the patterns of our events and experiences and see what <laughs> it was that, you know, what's happening there? Why, what, 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 was I, what was I projecting? What was I, what was I um, having expectations of another person about these? That's, that's all grist for the mill. That's all food for us to work out, I guess, what we're on about. So, um, do you think there could be a kind of educational paradigm 
um, which would help to nurture this kind of spiritual growth more? Or do you think it's fine as it is because, you know, maybe if it's sort of not perfectly set up to nurture your spiritual side, maybe that's good. Well, it is. It makes you find your own thing. Yeah, to find your own, yeah. yeah. Discovering, learning. I mean, back in the, whenever, the 80s, when there were wonderful new methods of teaching and learning coming into our education system, because my background was teaching. I was 30, 30 years in education. History? Was it? Teaching history and English and a bit of French, but then I went into R and D and went into curric um, educational philosophy. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, curriculum design, whole, okay. whole school and individual unit, new teaching methods that went away from um, you know, chalk and talk, the old chalk and talk method yeah. where the teacher is the fount of wisdom and just or, or book knowledge, book knowledge, and the kids regurgitate it back to your test time or. It was, it was really the new methods that came in um, were to do with students becoming more independent learners, becoming more independent um, researchers, inquiry rather than this is the facts. Or, although when you get to senior years, I taught um, you know, British history, Asian history, the French Revolution, and those poor Australian students over there who would, couldn't even say the Asian names, I, I had a difficult job too. But, just learning it out of the books and it, you try to jazz it up a bit but it's pretty tough that sort of education and yeah but the methods that we were bringing in in, in our lower levels was um what i call discovery learning but it was guided discovery because you can't wait you can't wait for one child to eventually find out what he wants to look at so you have a group of students you're you're responsible for and you may ha you have some goals at the end of it schools and conceptual understandings and uh, maybe attitudes, values, you're testing. But um, the process of giving the students excerpts of material to actually analyse and come up with some answers themselves about what those people were trying to do or what, what the, how the Eskimos lived and uh, their lifestyle and how they differed from their lifestyle and you're getting ideas of culture rather than just learning the facts about the Eskimos. So you're getting a, these new methods were very very good at ex um, developing higher level cognitive skills for students, processing them, not through, not just question answer and get the facts. That you know, and, and hearing you describe it, it sounds great. And I, and for me, intuitively, I feel like the students, most students would love it, would prefer it. Yeah. To me, it seems like the challenge would be getting the teachers who could pull it off. It seems like it's a harder teaching job. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my research on a, a new and different approach to history teaching, we, we did have to try, we, we've got some teachers who, to who, for whom the idea of what the course was offering was really to understand change and continuity through time, looking at concepts and skills rather than learning all the facts about ancient history and all the facts about this, that and the other, but to work with concepts, to work with a, a frame of reference that they could look outside and focus on things that have changed and things that have not changed and have an understanding of the processes of change. And when I think of it, what we were doing then, I had no idea about the spiritual dimension and karma and things like that. I'm thinking, whoops, <laughs> wasn't quite accurate what we were doing, but that was accurate at the time, put it that way. Right. So it required us to retrain teachers. Right. Because the new, pro new um, we learned from the mistakes in America, can I say that? Yeah. Uh, post Sputnik era, there was a whole lot of investment made in new education programs because to catch up with the Russians in those new math, new science, new social studies courses, a lot of money went into the development of those wonderful courses and they gave them the teachers to teach. Them. Perhaps the idea was to teacher-proof them. It doesn't work because the teachers yeah. will teach the way they have taught before so you must retrain teachers and those who, whose um, values and attitudes uh, compatible with or align with the philosophy of the course, which is student development and discovery, learning, inquiry, problem solving, things like that. But the problem with that approach, um, it requires twice as many teachers, it requires half size classrooms, right. and uh, you can't easily run set uh, student assessment tests. You know how schools are yeah. bedeviled by these um, yeah. tests, uh, national testing. 
Well, our initiative in education, what I call real education, was sort of stymied by the introduction of a national curriculum, national curriculum guidelines, national testing at different levels of the students' progress, like grade four, grade eight, you know, grade ten, on literacy, numeracy, four areas, um, maybe social, social studies, or something else. Yeah. So, so that approach for real education requires something that the governments and schools are not probably capable of devoting the funding for. I see. Being yeah. Rolling, you know, yeah. When there's so many other pressing things in health and transport, but they are the, in some gov some, you know, the, the, the more conservative governments tend to chop things back and the more socialist democrat governments seem to focus more on expanding education for all and making sure that all kids have a chance of, of uh, at least getting through high school and we have a, a, a certificate that sort of allows students to say they've, they've completed, successfully completed if they do, the secondary education and other certificates then maybe bridging to university. So, so that type of schooling, you're quite right to pick up, you need to retrain teachers. You also need to involve the parents because if you're changing your val the values of or the philosophy of education, the parents are used to the old chalk and talk and getting the 99 out of 100 or 70 out of 100 and then you go to assessing the students in terms of their uh, abilities, cognitive abilities, ability to solve a problem, to research data on their own. Well, you know, does that mean he got 100 or 60 out of 100? Right. So right. there's a lot of, when you introduce innovation, that's what I did my thesis on, innovation in education, um, you're really rocking the boat. You're rocking the status quo, yeah. And it requires a lot of the, the, so many educational innovations fail. And I can look at the difficulty and complexity of the ancient wisdom teachings, and I can say, well, the strategies that have been used, uh, maybe from you know in India and how the strategies of the, um, the lecture strategy is the most important one. It's, they're great for getting information across, but they're not so good in, in um, helping people to become independent learners. We, we, we're sort of left on our own for that. And you mentioned earlier that might be a good thing, but it's, you could have a balance here. Okay. I think in, in, a, in a lodge or a section you could, you could do both. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm wandering a little bit. No, no, that's I'm, fine. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple basic, traditional, theosophical questions. What, what is for you the most import, important teaching the secret doctrine holds for us today, or for you today? <sighs> mm, I think it, uh, that's, a, that's a question that requires answering one week to the next because I'll give you a really? different answer in yeah. between, right? Yeah. Okay. But I, uh, I, I think if, if Madame Blavatsky were here, she would say, wake up, <laughs> wake up. It's a time of awakening. I believe there are, there are some things, there are new energies I'm going really off out of, the, uh, out of the square here, I'm saying. There are some people who in are- the present. In the present yeah. time. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, are changing, are changing, <coughs> and uh, and it's spontaneous. It's not so much as a result of quite heavy intellectual work, but there's always a background of work and labour. Okay. And, and and some of a couple of, and they're not necessarily in the Theosophical Society. So, so I, I think this is a, a new, a transitionary period that might go on for seven hundred years, whatever. Yeah. So, but I think there's opportunities here in the breaking down of of the Piscean Age social institutions, the energies that go with that, the energies that go with, with ourselves breaking down our own structures of thinking. I think there's opportunities as, as the, the planet is seemingly getting really seriously in trouble at all sorts of levels. You can, I, I don't see, the, I see the trend as increasing natural disasters, yeah. okay? In intensity in, and variability and unpredictability I see also increasing, I don't see the war, conflictual situations abating at all. 
I mean, laugh. It's just so dismal. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, you know, it's almost like the snooze alarm, right? <laughs> that gets louder and louder, right? It just, it's just yeah, trying to get our but attention. It, but then remember, it's it's a stage. It's Shakespeare's stage. It's hard. To, it's hard to remember that sometimes when you, when you see when you see people the suffering that's going on around the world, and then it's hard to say, how can they have picked that spot to be there then? You know, how could they have? How could they have selected that for their growth? Well, you either in the wisdom or you're not in it. If you're not in it, you say, well, that's not fair. But if you're really breathing the teaching, you say, I take my hat off to them. You honour them for being in those situations and selecting those really, really difficult places to be in, where there's famine, where there's floods, where there's, where there's civil war, you know, a ceaseless civil war of families and uh, women and children just being... Uh, you know, just being killed off. And lots of lots of that, that sort of stuff is happening as as the dignity and respect of human life is just being degraded so many places. And then you think you can feel yourself the vibration getting heavier as you become a little bit depre depressed about it. But then you say, Well what is it what is this thing? What is this thing all about? And you've got to go back to seeing it with other eyes. And I I read a book by Annie Besson called Pain and Suffering before I came over to America. A little booklet. A little preparation for coming to America. Right? Yeah. <laughs> what's, your, what's in store for you? <laughs> what's in store for you? An interview with Dan News. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> Pain and Suffering. <laughs> but, you know, and she helped me see that, well, if someone only lives a certain time, then they go out in a famine. There's terrible circumstances in some of the countries in, in Africa and Asia and um, Middle East. Uh, they... They have chosen this, and it's for maybe. And Annie Besson suggested maybe to learn that the physical, the physical is so transitory. Mm. It is transitory, and mm -hmm. if that's learnt, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> Not a good thing, but you know, no, I mean, no, that's the beginning. Yeah, and uh, so, but it is very hard because it's it seems, it seems to me that the the forces, you know, there's the, this side and this side, the forces of darkness, if you like, and. Uh, uh, really, pretty much in control around the place, you know. And there's a reaction to that, I think, in terms of it's a challenge for us to look for the light in ourselves and, and look for the light in others and see it and so talk about. Now, would you say that last statement? Would you say that in the context of, say, like a theosophical idea that sort of the dark brotherhood or whatever, working with the light side to to help? catapult people or not necessarily yeah, it's not necessarily that, that optimistic or it could be that that's one be. Way, that's one way of looking at it right there's a way that um the one includes the dark side and the you know the darkness and the light yeah the one the dark and the light are in the one yeah so why it, it's 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 only through severe challenge does 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 something consolidate of your if you go from beliefs to a knowing like if if you you are strengthened through opposition, I'll put it that way. I think you're, you're strengthened when people oppose you. You're strengthened when groups oppose you. You are you're strengthened. Um, I'm not saying you should just stick to your mm -hmm, guns, but mm -hmm, oppos opposition mm -hmm. any any group or personal relationship or you know, any conflict. Well, there's an opportunity to to work towards some kind of harmonious whatever. But when it's when I think, uh, I mean, churches are, are finding it difficult to retain their numbers and to retain the uh, status they had in past centuries. So you see social institutions and, and organisations perhaps losing ground. Uh, so, but remembering that for the phoenix to arise, it's the bed of ashes that has to be Rise, it rises from the bed of ash, ashes. So, if you like, the dark, the dark can help, can catapult us further forward. But, gee, it's it's uh, it's a challenge to do so. And, um, right. uh, I don't know if you can call it because it's just the, yeah. there's a challenge every day to to wake up and and to say I'm, I'm the eternal changeless self, which I think Annie Besson said to say every morning. Yeah. You have to totally reprogramming you from where you were. Where you were, you have to unfreeze those things. This is a change model. Unfreeze, yeah. change, it's refreeze. Hard. It's so that hard. It takes <laughs> lifetimes and less. But it's like if you 
It's every day. You yeah. Know? Every day, every time, every you wash the dishes, that becomes your meditation. You're thinking, you know, you start thinking. Okay, you, you tune in. The, you, know, you try and tune into that oneness feeling again. You know, you, and then someone rings up. You've got to go and do something, and so you're pulled out of that. So the idea is, to, you zigzag in and out of these sorts of states of consciousness. I think for quite a while until you can consolidate an anchor, anchor yourself somewhere, but you'll still be pulled out. But they're the learnings when you're pulled out with emotional reactions to something. You know, they're out. They're our wonderful learning tools, aren't they? Well, wonderful. I'm not sure if I do. They're learning tools. Learning tools. I don't know if they're wonderful. Okay. Um, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, um, oh, do you still do a lot of meditation um, on, you know, in, a, in solitude to help you with, um, you know, the external wonderful teaching moments that pop up? Or, or do you not need to do it so much? I, I, yeah. um, I still need to do it more than I actually do in that solitude thing but I love to do it outside in the garden and that's when you feel feel things and uh, I'll tell a little story, I was outside in the garden once uh, I heard a heck of a din going on the sparrows were chirping madly and a neighbour's cat was coming down the fence right? and I thought, what are they carrying on about and <laughs> so I, I went and had a look and they, they flew away and I found a little fledgling sparrow in the garden bed and I thought, they saw the cat were trying to scream at the little fledgling sparrow. Get oh, out of here, boy. Oh, fly. Learn to fly. Learn to fly. You know, it's a danger. So the little guy didn't really much have much to fly with. So I picked him up and I just held him. And I feel his heart thumping. And he turned around and looked at me. Let me have it. It wasn't as if I was he the did. cat. Yeah. Oh. And I thought, he's such a confident little chap, you know, yeah. or little uh, girl or whatever. Yeah. But in that moment of just holding that little sparrow, and feeling his heart thump. I could feel my heart thumping. And I thought, little things like that help you to tune into the one heart, you know, thumping the one heart of the universe. And that's a meditation in itself. Little things like that can happen. But going back to your question, yes, I, I do need to, to still keep that solitude to, to re-gather myself because it's, it's something that is precious when you can just pull back and, and uh, be in the other space. Yeah. And, and that's also so important when we're trying to deprogram ourselves. We do a lot of intellectual work on working on ourselves to get rid of our baggage, to identify you know, the issues that are maybe, yeah, holding us, not holding us back, but that are preventing us to be in harmony with our, within which leads to harmony without. Yeah. So when you're doing that, and you sometimes, you know, you're very hard on yourself, but yeah. sometimes um, you just need to go away from that because the intellect can get too dominating and wants to solve the problems and fix everything. See, there's influence of the intellect on, on um, working through your issues. You've got to watch that sometimes. It's best to go in and just be in that space bring in a more spiritual way of looking at things and that lifts you out of it. And being in that more spiritual way of looking at things would be meditation? Yeah, no, you can look or, at it, um, if, I, if I'm having a, um, just take, you know, I was on, on the board of Water Corporation and there's a little bit of politics going on at the table sometimes at some meetings and that's fine, that's how things work through. Um, if someone said something that I thought was a little bit, uh, I, I felt I, would rea I had a reaction to myself, right? I had a reaction, a negative reaction. I made a judgment. Yeah. Instead of just going with the issues, I made a personal judgment. That goes with the t territory of separateness. It goes with the programming. It goes with understanding projection and how you project your own images onto other people. And yeah. Like if I had said that, I, <laughs> I'd be doing the wrong thing. You know, all this, yeah. this stuff. So. To come back and just stop trying to intellectualize it out of its existence. You see how you can do too, I can do too much intellectualizing about it. If I can just look at it as, he's okay, I'm okay. Let's just, Dorothy, focus on the issue at the hand and, uh, and, and leave the judgments if you, to later, you know. Don't let it trip you into a hole. 
of self judgment. I don't know if I explained no, it. No, it makes total you sense. Know? Yeah. So, non judgment of others, and this is what I'm learning, starts with non judgment of the self. That's a big starting point. Because we are brought up in that programming to see, to. Uh, to protect the ego, right? Right. You know, right. You, you either expand it out and you fly high right. to crash right. it down, right. or, or you, you're trying to, feeling vulnerable, so you try to avoid any diminishing of the ego, basically. Very, um, very simple way of saying mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. so you may judge things and people in order to feel better about yourself. Um, yeah. So it's just, you know, that's one part of self knowledge, too, that um, Sinnott found out from Master Katumi. I don't know if you remember it, but he he asked Mahatma, did, could he see into past lives? Of course, he would have been fishing for info about his past yeah, yeah. lives, right? Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. And <laughs> Mahatma said, well, unfortunately, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he, right. yeah, he said, but he said, wouldn't it be yeah. of more benefit if you, if you learned more about, and he said, the personality that you are before wanting to know about what fashioned it or what shaped it. So it's very important for us to understand our personality, what makes us act as we are, you know, as we do. So that's understanding the personality is really, really, really important and how we have been conditioned and birth, that sort of stuff. But not to sort of really yeah. you know, make a roast dish out of it or something. You know? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, that's a beautiful It's awareness, answer. you know. Awareness and, and, yeah. and with plenty of compassion. Yeah, right? yeah. and I, I just remember talking about Mahatma. He, you know, in 1900, because you raised the idea about education, okay, and in 1900 in his letter, did he, was he, no, it wasn't 1900. That's when he said, get out of intellectuality and go towards spirituality. That was number one. Curb, he said, curb the intellectuality and move over towards spirituality. But in in a uh, in a letter, uh, he said something about it was that's right. It was when the um, London fiasco was happening. You know, the London Lodge, Blavatsky Lodge in London, and he made a comment about how to the Indians the masters weren't an issue. It was part of their cultural conditioning. I'm adding. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but and he said, he said, occult teachings in the West need to be, and it has yet have not happened. Need to be. Um, it didn't say restated. I wish I could remember it. Need to be. I'll say adjusted to the individual's development and the country in which he lives. He said that, which to me is a, he's a wonderful curriculum designer. Because that's what we do in education, in, in the research and development. You, you start with the students at, you take notice of where he's coming from in a certain situation, and you work from that. So to go to America or Australia where the, where the Mahatmas or the Masters are not, a, are not just part of the fabric of, of social beliefs or philosophical beliefs or religious beliefs, it's... It's just alien. A lot of concepts of the wisdom are alien to our cultures, our Western cultures. So maybe we do need to rethink our educational strategies and how we approach in our lodges, um, discussion groups and workshops, bearing in mind that particular thing that we need to adapt to the individuals and to um, the country. And well, it was really saying the conditioning what the people have. and. Uh, as Blavatsky said, if we don't take heed of that, the society will end up stranded on a sandbank of thought, like a dying carcass stranded on a sandbank of thought. A sandbank of thought. Quite an uh, image. It's, yeah. it's, I always remember that image. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. And yet, and yet, she's saying if if the TS doesn't do something about, we're all born into a generation. We're of our generation. And unless the, the TS can help its members to identify, to be aware of it, and to or manage it, that's how the TS will end up. All right. Well, then let's let that be our segue into our final question. There's no bell. It's just I'm just going to say final question. Okay. And so, what kinds of things could the TS do? <laughs> 
<laughs> um, well, let me just let me just restate what I what what seems to me to be the biggest irony is that we have so we have so many intellectual riches in approaching the spiritual path. And there's so much of that, and that's one of the big things we have to offer. Um, however, th we're always sort of warning ourselves, right, not to get caught up, or my, or my, right. seeing it from too much of a separate separation. Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I'm? Well, um, so, like, like this irony, for, from my perspective, is that is that we have all of these intellectual challenges, riches given to us in the spiritual context. But, you know, one of the dangers seems to be, almost unconsciously, is that if you start studying these things, somewhere in you, you start to think, I really know something. Boy, I'm making some progress. You maybe start patting yourself on the back. You start solidifying the concept, right? And you yeah. Get, yeah. You, know, you get defensive about it if somebody challenges it. So how do you? That's a learning point, isn't it? <laughs> that's a learning. So just, wait, just 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 keep open to the learning points. Is that yeah. right? Um, I, I uh, guess so. I I think that there's there's <laughs> such. A, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, what a I, sloppy I, I, question. No, it, it's you know I, I started to talk earlier on. I think I lost it somewhere about it. You know, Annie Besant's vision of a new culture, a new inner civilization. Um, where we walk the walk, we walk the talk, and we walk the walk, and these intellectual riches are there, as maybe first base, or maybe we're still in the dig dugout, you know, right. reading the manual, yeah. reading the manual, or, yeah. or, or but I going, go, getting out there, and, yeah. and, and uh, changing the way we look at things, which leads to changing the way we think about things. It'll mean changing our language we use, like we don't say we die. You know, my father left the body three years ago. Okay, what's wrong with that? I, I, that's not original, actually. I got that from the Brahma Kumaris. <laughs> and I used to think, what a weird way of saying it. You know, let's get over this brotherhood and let's get some sisterhood there or kinship. Let's do it. Don't, don't have a long intellectual debate about <laughs> it. Just do it. You know, and uh, I think that's that's the issue. But I, I really have to think, too, that there are our members who really just need to be in that space of reading all those riches that are, that are part of our theosophical literature. Yeah. And maybe this lifetime, they really do not want to go into the changing me, changing themselves or anything like that. They don't see it at this time as being necessary or want to do it. Just because I want to do it or think I should do it. Or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't mean that everyone has. So, this has implications for uh, the, the society, a lodge, or a section, because you have different, like a classroom. You have how do you cater for individual difference? So you can, you can in your in your programs, you can maybe um, work with intellectual knowledge and with with a worldview that is still, well, I would say to be developed a little further than what the existing one is because what I'll be looking for is in in curriculum design you, in the new um, the new education we were looking at the way every discipline of knowledge including philosophies have a have a perspective like I use the term a looking glass a way of seeing the world a way of looking at it a way of speaking about it a way of inquiring into it and a way of um, uh, writing the reports of those inquiries so it's unique it's to mathematics, to different sciences, history, geography, sociology, but philosophy is included in that as well, with the key concepts of um, truth and reality. And we have these wonderful propositions um, from various sources, from Blavatsky, and, um, that have been summed up and expanded on by other, other I think, um, the Anthony Hoskins gathered them together in a book called Esoteric Philosophy or Fundamentals of that or something. These to me are, are keys to uh, to um, organising our knowledge about the world when we look out there and we want to see it with the eyes of spirit, if you like, spiritual perception. And that, th that's part of uh, a mechanism for doing so. But if we don't want to do any more than that, we don't want to... Um, take what we call the spiritual path, that's fine, because 
the law of compassion. We have quite a long time to work through that, haven't we? <laughs> and, and what a compassionate source, or what a, com you know, a compassion, compassionate creator or uh, principle that operates here with, with that compassion because there's no judgment and this is this is the hardest thing for to bring home. Good point. There is no judgment. And we fluff around here <laughs> and we judge ourselves, we judge each other. Yeah, right, right. And we judge the bombers and we judge the yeah, right. we right. judge it all. But we lose sight, you know, we say, Well it's not an illusion. My very first convention I went to in Australia this is not an illusion, this is, I can feel it and touch it and do everything else, so it's not a nonsense, you know, but it's to see it as a relative, a relative reality of schoolhouse, I call it, schoolhouse. Well, you know, I'm glad I asked that awkward question, <laughs> dripped, dripping with judgment. Um, no, thank you, it was a nice learning point for me. Um, I did, I, no, no, no. Was, did I answer the question? You did, I, I did absolutely. Go. Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, you're um, you're a great piano player and a fun person to be around. And <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much <laughs> uh, Dan. For, for being here and good good response, uh, Dan. Yeah. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for being a good guitar player and oh, interviewer. Thank you. And